You're watching KLTX, Channel 15, serving the city of Lufkin. Welcome to the September edition of Forest Country Gardening. My name is Elaine Cameron and I'm an Angelina County Master Gardener. Today we are back at Joe Pace's home, whom you'll remember from last month, talking about identifying trees in your landscape. There is just so much to look at at his place, we couldn't cover it all in one episode. Joe, thanks for having us out again. Hey, I appreciate that. Hey. I'm, I'm glad to show it. Great to be here. And Joe, you have some uh, small things to show us about yeah. trees. Yeah. If you would. yeah, yeah. Let me, let me just start here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about pine trees. Um, of course, everybody's familiar with pine cones. Um, but in, uh, interesting to me, in, in East Texas, we have basically three different species of pine that is native to this area. Longleaf pine, shortleaf pine, and loblolly pine. And the most common one is loblolly. We, we, those are probably, if you see a pine tree, it's probably gonna be loblolly. You have to go down into the southern part of Angelina County, like down the other side of Zavala maybe, uh, to uh, start finding much in the way of longleaf pine. But, uh, so I don't have one of those here to show you, but I wanted to show you shortleaf because it's one of our native pines, it has small cones and uh, short needles. And to me, the interesting thing is, if I can get the right one here, the, uh, the needles, of course, occur in bunches on, on, on the branches, but on shortleaf pine, you typically have two needles per fascicle. And with, with loblolly pine, you would typically have three. And I can't pull one off here, but, but anyway, that you, you can see that, <laughs> I think you can, that there are just two, two needles in that. Um, and that, that's real typical of shortly. Of course, it has a, sh a shorter needle uh, compared to loblolly. Loblolly has larger cones and the needles come in threes in the fascicle. Um, I can get those off, but you can see three, three needles in that, in that fascicle. Uh, I will say this, there is some variation. You don't always have three or always have two, but that's the typical rule. Um, also, this time of year, the squirrels are going crazy with mm -hmm. pine cones. The, the seeds in the pine cones mature uh, in late summer and early fall, and uh, the squirrels go out, they will tear these cones apart one, one uh, scale at a time to get the seeds out of that, and you'll find these littering on the ground underneath your tree with literally thousands of scales that they rip off of the cones as, as they get to the seeds. So some, sometimes that can make kind of a, a mess in your yard, Elaine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, here, here are the, the cones from loblolly pine. You can see they're considerably larger than the, the cones on shortleaf pine. Um, but I wanted to mention that, and I also wanted to mention about pine, what the major pests of pine trees uh, all across the south, really, are what we call pine bark beetles and they are a very tiny little beetle that uh, will, will attack and kill the pine trees. And I don't know how close you can get to look at that, but I've got a, a couple dozen here in my hand that uh, just show how tiny they are. Of course, one of those could not kill your pine tree. It takes, it takes them working together uh, to do that. But, uh, but they can really cause some significant problems in our pine trees uh, in your yard or in the forest, e either one where sometimes uh, they can kill large areas of trees. But I, wanted, I just wanted to mention that, that most people don't realize they're so tiny uh, and that they, they, they you know, cause a lot of problems. When you have a tree down in your yard, it's usually pretty expensive to, to remove it. So Joe, tell us about the oak leaves you have there. Well, we have several different oaks that occur in this area native, uh, probably a dozen or more. Uh, two of the most common ones are, are called southern red oak and post oak. Um, the southern red oak is kind of interesting. This, this is a leaf of a southern red oak. Um, but if you turn kind of upside down, 
typically they have this bell-shaped base on them that is very characteristic of that tree. And also, if you think about a clapper in a bell, the clapper is way too long for the bell, so it hangs down below. Oh, okay. Uh, but that, that shape is real typical of the southern red oak. And then the post oak is a little, oh, one other thing about the southern red oak. The t tips of these little lobes on the leaf will have a little spine on them. Cool. Uh, and the other oak, post oak, does not have that. They have a smooth, smooth uh, uh, tip on the ends, ends of the lobes on the branch, on the on the leaf. But the the shape of the post oak leaf tends to be kind of cross shaped. You can see a vertical and a horizontal, maybe like holding your arms out to the side. But that's real typical of post oak. So those are our two common, probably most common oaks, in addition to water oak, which we talked about last Great. week. Great, good. Yeah. Well, that's helpful because it's sometimes it's hard. There's so many oaks. So many oaks. It's yeah. hard to identify yeah. or remember yeah. everything yeah. about them. You're right. Exactly. Great. Yeah. Good information. So, Joe, tell us what's the proper way to trim a limb from a tree. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of confusion about that, Elaine. Uh, branches when they come out right near the the the, the branch where they uh, join the other part of the tree, there's a collar called mm -hmm. the branch collar. And a lot of times when people prune, they will leave a little short stub or stub mm -hmm. of branch. That's a that's a big no-no. Uh, what happens, decay gets in that and it works its way into the tree. It doesn't necessarily kill the tree, but it's just not good. But if you cut that right at the branch collar, this callus tissue you can see right here will begin to form and it will eventually close that wound and, and, and basically make it so you don't even tell it's there anymore. So when you cut the, and this one, you can see the white, mm -hmm. I, I painted that with, with latex paint. Right. Uh, to keep fungal spores from landing on that fresh cut so that, that it would help prevent any disease from getting in there. And the, the people at Texas A&M tell me that if you don't put the wound paint on there real soon, within a couple hours of the time you cut, you probably hadn't done much good with it. If you do it two or three days later, it's pro probably don't mess with it. Not, not worth doing. But this one has done a nice job of, of healing. This is probably about three years old. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it is, it'll, in a few more years, it'll be completely closed in. Great. So the paint's like a band-aid. You put like on a to band keep exactly. the dirt out of your cut. Exactly. Let's exactly. look at this tree behind you, Joe. And I think you said there was a callus that had. Yeah, it's, in. It's, it's, this is a, a red oak tree here that had a big wound right here several years ago, and it has completely closed over and healed that up. It's hard to even tell, but. This area right here, you can if you look close, you can kind of see the bark is different there, mm -hmm. but that's where that has completely closed over and, and, and healed that, that wound that was on that tree from several years ago. This probably dates back maybe uh, 15 or more years ago, mm -hmm. uh, but but it, it, it closed it up. Closed and if you'd left a stob there, that wouldn't that, have happened? Yeah, you, you would have decay all around that. That then. would not have happened. Yeah, it wouldn't have, wouldn't happen. yeah. yeah. So Joe, tell us, the beauty berries have turned color since we were here last month. Yeah, just in a few weeks, they've gone from being green to their beautiful fall purple color. Um, and again, like I said, if we, birds, birds really like these, but just in a matter of uh, two or three weeks, they've, they've changed from green to, to purple. A beautiful iridescent purple. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. So you'll start seeing these on, on the beauty berry now, from now on until till leaf drop. Bir birds love them, though. They, they'll use them in the winter. So Joe, what tree is this? Okay, it's another one of our real common broadleaf trees, sweet gum. Everybody's probably heard of sweet gum, and they have this really characteristic kind of five lobe, almost star-shaped leaf that's uh, nothing else in East Texas quite like it. Some of the maples will resemble this, but, but really th th this is distinct enough that I'll always be able to be told. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to point out sweet gum because it is so common. Right. And it turns pretty colors in the fall. Get some good colors in the fall, yeah. some deep reds and purples on them. Yeah, it, it's a nice landscape tree. Yeah, years ago, an elderly woman told me about why it's called sweet gum, and she grew up some time ago. But they couldn't afford to go to the store to buy gum, so they would peel back the bark, bark yeah. and there's a gummy substance, and that's what the kids would have for chewing gum back chewing in the gum. day. Yeah, yeah. I have not done that personally, but I've heard about that, yeah. Joe, what's going on here with this tree? Okay, this is an interesting tree. You can see the berries on it. Uh, this is called deciduous holly. It's another one of our hollies, and the leaves all fall off in the winter. Uh, the berries turn red, and birds love it. But this webbing you see on here is actually uh, from a little caterpillar called fall webworm. And they get the name fall, even though they occur in the summer, because the adults, are, uh, the moth itself is present in the fall of the year. But it's a little caterpillar. They make this webbing. Doesn't really hurt the tree. They do eat a few leaves, but... Uh, 
the biggest uh, uh, complaint about it is the kind of unattractive webbing that they may make in the branches. But there's this whole webbing is just full of probably two or three dozen little caterpillars in there that are making the webbing and, and eating the leaves. But it's really not an issue from the standpoint of the health of the tree. It's just aesthetic because it doesn't look good. So Joe, this is a red maple you said? Exactly, yeah, this is a red maple and I wanted to show it because of the fact that it's another one of our, not too many of the trees have opposite leaf arrangements. You can see they come out side by side uh, on the branch here. Um, and uh, uh, dogwoods and ash and maple are some of the more common ones that have opposite leaves. Most of the trees are gonna be alternating where they stagger up and down the branch. The interesting thing to me about red maple is that uh, in the spring when things first barely begin to, usually in February, flowers will occur on here which will eventually become seeds that have a little wing on, kind of like a pine seed, and they'll come fluttering down like a helicopter. But the seeds will come out just about the time the leaves just begin to unfold. So the, the flowers and the leaves are first thing in the spring and they're, and they're red and, and kind of pretty. The flowers are real small, but they cluster and they're real pretty. Right, this past year, they were especially pretty and I'd say they'd rival the red buds. Yeah, yeah. They were bright red yeah, and blooming. Pretty. And of course, everybody hears about maple in the fall with the colors. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll get good colors on, on our maples here in East Texas. So this, you get two seasons of pretty colors. Exactly, exactly. We often have them in our plant sale. Uh, good. Unfortunately, I don't believe we have any this year, uh -huh. but we've sold yeah. them in our plant sale. Yeah, we yeah. have one in our yard we really enjoy. Yeah, but they're a neat tree, neat tree. Okay, I wanted to mention this tree here. Uh, it's sugarberry or hackberry. Those two names are used interchangeably. Uh, technically, uh, hackberry doesn't occur here, but sugarberry is very common. But the, the Warty bark is very characteristic uh, of sugarberry. Um, but I just wanted to mention it. You see it in your landscape, and uh, they're neat trees. They got little berries on them that the birds will eat. Uh, some there's some certain butterflies that are very, uh, very attracted to this tree for their caterpillars. So, uh, but it's a good, good tree. Sh sugarberry, hackberry. This, this looks to be a shrub, Joe. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, this is a shrub, but it's something we don't like in our landscape. This is called privet. And it's an invasive, exotic plant. It's not native to our part of the world, so it takes the place of something that ought to be growing here. But uh, privet is getting more and more common, uh, especially on the edges. Birds will drop berries, and that stuff grows up, and it'll get real thick. And um, uh, it's uh, it's kind of a mess. I, I have it, it's, it's here on my place because it was here when I bought the property, but I, I haven't eradicated it. I've, I've left it, but I trim it back. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's something we don't like to have in our landscape because it's not native. Right, and people brought it in. They used to have privet hedges, mm -hmm. but I believe it comes from Asia. Yes, I think it's Asia. A good example of we really want to use plants that are native to our, to area, our area, or at least the Western Hemisphere. Exactly. But it, it was a beautiful shrub, but it's taken over. And I've noticed, I think in far east Texas, we've seen roadsides that are just solid, solid. privet. Yes. So when privet's there, the plants that our insects and birds need are not are there. Are not there, yeah. So it is a really important thing and it's a great example to keep to show people. Yeah. Here are some berries. Yeah, there's some berries. And the, I think they're tiny, but I think in uh, winter they turn they, dark. They turn dark, dark, dark blue or purple color, yeah. So also we, notice that uh, it's got opposite leaves. You can see the right. leaves come out side by side on the, on the stem. So they're easy to recognize. So if you have those on your property, the best thing is to take it out. Take it out, yeah. Take it out. Okay, Joe, what do we have here? Um, Elaine, this is, this is black gum, a native tree uh, in our area here. Real nice fall colors. Usually one of the first trees in like August to begin turning color, especially if we have some dry weather. But I also wanted to point it out because the, uh, the pith or the center of, these, of the little branches is what they call a chambered pith. And, and inside that, there are little tiny chambers that if you take a pocket knife and just kind of cut halfway into it, you can see little divisions in there. They're very small, but it's one of the few trees in our part of the world that have a chambered pith. So uh, that's, that's kind of neat. I just want to mention that because it's not too common. The other thing that's kind of neat, right up here, <laughs> hanging off this branch, is a, a cocoon of one of our silk moths, probably a luna moth, but uh, it had been parasitized probably by a fly and uh, the, the moth never came out of that. But I just saw this hanging there as a nice uh, a silk cocoon made, made by one of our silk moths, kind of neat. Um, but 
also, I, I'm, I'm saying that because, you know, not being a tree, but the fact that there are all kinds of things in our, in our forests, in our landscapes that are not necessarily plants. Another one that, that I've, I've found uh, just this morning as I was walking around out here was uh, feathers from uh, a, a white-winged dove and a couple of feathers from blue jays that were just on the ground that had been shed. So there's all kinds of things, if you look around, that uh, are, can be of interest if you're if you're in, into environmental stuff and one other thing i'll mention real quick uh this is a, a green briar or smilex it's kind of nature's barbed wire <laughs> uh, it can have some really nasty thorns on it and it, it'll get some i've seen some of the some of the uh, vines it's a vine some of the vines will be almost as big as your arm but they'll be have these nasty stiff uh, uh thorns on there that will grab you and, and tear your skin open Right. So I try to get rid of it. It is native, but I, I try to get rid of it because it's so noxious to people. Now, there's an interesting thing about Smilex. The shoots on the end, the deer love, mm -hmm. and they are high protein. High protein, okay. And I was talking to someone the other day. He told me that they had protein blocks out for the deer. Because they had so much Smilex, they didn't need the protein block. Oh, God. So it's a great deer forage. Yeah. And we were told once when we had someone come talk to us about finding food in the wild, that the very green tips can be eaten by humans. By people, right. So if you're ever in a pinch, just remember your Smilex vines. <laughs> but good. only the green tips. Good, good. Joe, we were talking about this cocoon a minute ago, and you mentioned that there's a parasitizing wasp or fly that laid eggs in the caterpillar. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the wasp or fly will find that caterpillar, lay an egg on it, the egg will hatch into a tiny little larva uh, they actually go inside the caterpillar of, of the silk moth and feed inside and it won't immediately kill it but the the caterpillar will never ne the moth caterpillar will never become a moth mm -hmm. uh, but this one it got to the it, to the point where it made a cocoon mm -hmm. and uh and inside that was the pupa and the the pupa never emerged to be a moth but the, there's some tiny little round holes in this where the the fly or wasp emerged and flew off to to carry on their life cycle but there's all kind of checks and balances in nature. We don't think about the little guys that we don't see that uh, play an important role in, in keeping things in balance. Right, and for our gardening friends, some gardening friends run to get the spray whenever they see yeah. anything crawling. Yeah. But yeah. remember, it's a very small number of insects that are harmful. Exactly. Most insects are beneficial. beneficial. So that's an example of a beneficial insect. If you reduce the number of chemicals you use in your garden and let things work, you will find you will have a balance because the more you spray, the more you use chemicals, the more you have to use chemicals because you've destroyed the beneficial insects as well as those that are the pest. So just keep that in mind. Think about the balance in your gardens. Yeah. There's, there's a web, an in, uh, intricate web of all this living stuff, plants and animals, that uh, depend on each other. Right. Yeah. So, Joe, you said this is a viburnum? This is another viburnum. Uh, Elaine, we have several different viburnums here. We talked about one last month uh, called Rusty Blackhaw. This one is either arrowwood viburnum or maple leaf viburnum. I'm not sure which one, but it's, it's a opposite leaves. In fact, if you look on this little stem here, you can see very clearly how they come out opposite each other. Um, but uh, some of one of our opposite. But it's, it's kind of an unusual plant in the landscape. You don't see lots of them around. At least I haven't. Um, but I found this out here and said, oh wow, I got a, I got a viburnum, another viburnum. Pretty foliage and nice for the landscape because I believe it turns color in the yes, fall. Yes, yeah, it gets so some good color good in addition, the fall. Good they have native. a flower on them early in the year. So. And berries to feed and the wildlife. And berries for wildlife, So yeah. a great plant for your for landscape. Great. And also, I want to mention something else about pine. There's a disease, a fungus, that gets on pine trees called fusiform rust. And they get the name rust because in the spring, the spores are just bright orange like rust. Hmm. Um, and they, it causes a swelling. This, this, this is actually the, the very base of a, a tree that it killed, but you can see how it kind of swells up here. And here's another one right here on this one that's still a live tree. But uh, uh, they, 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 the, the life cycle of that rust is interesting because it has alternating hosts. The spores that are orange that are produced in the mm -hmm. spring are carried by wind currents to developing oak leaves. On the oak leaves, you get some tiny little spores you never even notice that are carried back by wind currents to the growing tips of the pine tree. So it has to go from pine to oak to pine to oak to pine to interesting. oak. Interesting. Very interesting life cycle. I don't know how they ever figured it out, but, but somebody did. 
Um, but I wanted to mention it because it, it'll usually, a lot of times when it's on the main stem, mm -hmm. it'll kill the, kill the tree. If it's on a branch, it'll kill the branch, but the tree will probably live. Wow, interesting. Uh, interesting. This is an American holly, John? American holly, Elaine, yeah. And uh, they're kind of a neat tree. They're evergreen. Um, they uh, have spiny leaves like you think about holly around Christmas time. But uh, they're, they're, uh, they're a good plant to have in your landscape. Evergreen, uh, spiny leaves, so if you walk out here barefoot, it wouldn't be too comfortable. But uh, a nice tree to make. And this is a, a, a male holly tree because it doesn't have any, any berries on it. We mentioned last week about yopon, and, which is a holly, um, and the uh, deciduous holly, which is another holly, and now American holly. As we mentioned last week, only the female trees have berries. They have male and female trees and uh, only the females have berries. So this one, I've never seen berries, so I'm presuming it's a male tree. Um, but, but a nice tree in your landscape. And in this early, early spring, they bloom. Yes. And if you ever stand under a holly tree, you can hear all the bees. Yeah, buzzing, they, yeah. May not even, so good, does attract Pollinators me. love it, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's great yeah. for that. Now I might mention, we've been looking at trees and the leaves look a little shaggy. But that's because we're late in the season. Right. Right. They, they've been through you know, a whole growing season now, we're getting close to the end of it. So they, they've had a, a lot of abuse over the last right. several months right. with rain and, and heat and, and uh, uh, just all kinds of things that affect them over the growing season. So American Holly, a good, a great tree for your landscape. We are fortunate that we have three in our front yard. I think two are male and one female. Yeah, so I always yeah. have berries for yeah. Christmas. That's good. That's good. And yeah. they have pretty um, bark. Yeah, it's pretty, white. pretty bark. Yeah. White yeah. Yeah. bark. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, American Holly, good, good tree, good tree. So Joe, you were talking about how you maintain your forest area back here. Yeah, this uh, I, I have what I call pruning it up. I've re, I've come in here and removed by pruning a lot of the lower branches on these trees, so that it's easy to walk through here now, without having a whole bunch of other stuff getting in your way. And I call it I call it like park like maybe, where it's nice and open. But the other thing is I've got a pretty continuous overstory of of leaves, especially in the summertime, where not much sunlight gets to the ground. So there's not just a whole a lot of other stuff coming up in here because of lack of sunlight. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep the sunlight out of here, uh, it won't grow up in the, in the uh, underneath. So you can keep it open and park like to, to make it easy. And I enjoy walking around out here, right? Not yeah. fighting the brush all the time. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, I'm sitting on a stump here that uh, is the remains of Hurricane Ike from 20, 2008, I guess it was. Uh, but this this was a large oak, post oak tree here on the, in the woods back here that didn't survive the storm and I did make some firewood out of it but I've left this stump here just as a, uh, a thing for other critters to, to uh, take advantage of or to use, to utilize. Also right here beside it is some poison ivy. I'll, I'll touch this gingerly because I'll get poison ivy but uh, you can see the leaves are in threes. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And uh, the, the leaves and the stem and the roots all contain the toxin that are sensitive that our skin is sensitive to that will cause you to break out so uh, I try to keep poison ivy out of here uh, so I'll, I'll eventually get rid of this I, I don't spray it with uh, something like a herbicide but I, I pull it up very carefully um, but uh, poison ivy is something we probably don't like just because it, it's a, a problem to our skin so here we are beside a specimen of wax myrtle wax myrtle yeah it's the only one I have on my property <clears throat> and I, I kind of treat it with tender, loving care. There you go. <laughs> but uh, it, they're, they're a neat landscape. See, mostly it's a shrub. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's evergreen, and uh, they produce some berries, um, and people will collect those berries. They're kind of a, a purplish color, mm -hmm. a, a milky color, and they'll boil them, and, and the, wax will, <clears throat> the wax will come to the top. They skim that off and they make candles out of it, scented candles. Right, that's what know. early people did. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. It also is very waxy, oily. If you rub the leaves, it has a nice, pleasant yeah, fragrance. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a real good flavor. But as far flavor. as fire-wise goes, yeah. uh, you don't want to plant it right next to your house because of the oil, it would basically explode in a fire. Yeah. So it's a great thing to have in your landscape, but plant it out, out away right. from your buildings. Exactly. But uh, yeah, it's a great plant. And I've heard there's stories, early East Texans would cut branches of it and put it under their pier and beam houses to keep the pest away. Okay. 
yeah. to keep the fleas off the dogs. <laughs> I don't know if that was true, but that's what I've heard. Yeah. I hadn't heard so, that, but it could well be. You never well know. Yeah. You never yeah. know. And thanks, Joe, oh, for having us out at your property I, again. I'm honored that you came. This has <clears> been <throat> wonderful. Yeah. Mark your calendar for these upcoming events. On Tuesday, September 17th, from 12 noon to 1 p.m., the noon program will feature Dawn Stover from SFA Gardens, who will talk about native plants. The program is free to the public, will run from 12 noon to 1, and you may bring your lunch. Angelina Master Gardener's Fall Native Plant Sale will be held on Saturday, September 28th, beginning at 8 a.m. at the Master Gardener's Greenhouse in the Farmer's Market. We will offer native grasses, perennials, shrubs, trees, and vines. Edible selections will include citrus, native fruit trees, and herbs. Proceeds fund scholarships and educational projects at the Master Gardener's. Plant lists will be posted on Angelina County Master Gardener Facebook page in late September. And this concludes the September edition of Forest Country Gardening. Until next time, this is Elaine Cameron wishing you happy gardening.